Hey, welcome back to the Lymphate Coaching Podcast, where we talk about the most important topics in fitness and nutrition, and we make them more practical for you. I'm Coach Caleb, and today we are talking about the Indian diet. Man, there's so many good things about the Indian diet. With experience in India over the years, working with different athletes and individuals, I'm excited to talk about this topic with you today as a nutritionist the observations are made over the last nine to ten years in india man there's some awesome things about it there's some things that we can learn from it and i want to equip you with some tools today for how you can eat on an indian diet and do well with it so let's jump in on this podcast today All right, so today I'm excited to talk about this because I mean I've, I've grown to have like a, such a strong attachment to India. I've been working in and out of India for the last ten years, and man, it's been a, a crazy journey just getting to experience the different smells and flavors of India. It's so unique um, with the Indian flavors. If you have not had Indian food, I'll just say this up front: you're missing out. You have uh, you've missed out on some amazing experiences in your uh, food palette, man. If you have not had it, I need you to go down the street, go to the, the closest Indian restaurant you can find, or Indian friend, and have some Indian food. Uh, because man, you're missing out if you haven't had some. Because the flavors are so deep and rich and layered, uh, it's something that you can't find in any other um, international cu- cuisine. So. Awesome. But today I want to go through some observations that I've made over the years. You know, uh, having a worldwide experience in multiple different countries, it's it's awesome being a nutritionist because because you get to understand the the pluses and minuses of every single diet around the world. And it's not necessarily I'm not talking about diets like popular diets. I'm talking about traditional ways of eating. And so when I'm talking about the Indian diet today, I'm talking about how do people from the country of India and their culture and their families and their society tend to eat and, and why is that and what does that lead to in the way that their bodies work and look and function and what are maybe some things that we can learn from that or how can we actually eat best um, how can we eat on that style of a diet of nutrition and actually find a high level of fitness and high level of um, results that we want to have and so uh, then over the years, being in India, I mean, I've, I've learned a lot from the Indian diet. You know, I've had a lot of different Indian foods. I love like traditional foods, like uh, <laughs> something like biryani or something from the tandoor oven. Man, everything coming from the tandoor oven, whether it's vegetarian or non-vegetarian, everything tastes awesome. Um, Indians have mastered the art of blending spices and layering different flavor, flavors and food to bring out all the flavors in that food. It just makes it taste amazing. So huge respect for Indian cuisines. Um, but we do need to say, I do need to say that, man, there, when it comes to diets, there is no silver bullet. There is no best diet. You can't say that a high-protein Western diet that has meat on almost every single plate um, is better than... Uh, East Asian diet, not just Indian, but anything in East Asia where it tends to be higher carb or something like that. You can't say a Mediterranean diet is better than um, the American diet. You can't say any one diet is necessarily better than the other because across the developed world, people are dealing with the same problems of obesity and chronic disease. and <laughs> And so all of us are dealing with the same issues to approximately around the same percentages in every developed country. And so we're all just as unhealthy. And so there's no necessarily a silver bullet. There's no best diet. It really depends on the person, what works for you, your lifestyle, your activity level, uh, and what fits your flavor palette, your preferences and everything. And, And finding ways to get better portion sizes for what your body actually needs. And so, uh, because there's no silver bullet, like you find, that there's people who are extremely healthy in every area. There's healthy people in America and in, in the Western world. There's healthy people in India and in the Eastern world. Um, everybody in every culture, there's there's people who are really fit, really jacked, really lean and 
in great shape. And so there's lots of things that go into that from their upbringing to their genetics to their lifestyle choices to the food that they eat. It's an all-inclusive thing um, that helps us to have a, a great body, a great physique, a great uh, performance level and everything. And so it's not necessarily any one thing. It's, it's multiple things that add up to a whole. And so uh, I wanted you to have that context going into this because there's some great things about the Indian diet, and then there's definitely some things about the Indian diet that could be better for many people. Um, but you can say the same things or many similar things about any other type of diet. So I don't want you to just hear any negatives that I say because there's lots of positives as well. And so uh, let's jump into a little bit more about Indian food, okay? So um, things that I've noticed about the, the Indian diet is it's just the way it is. And so going to make some just observations here as i've visited people in their homes gone out to eat with people prepared indian food in our own home as well notice that indian food tends to be very high carb um, so if you're going to look at some, a typical plate you would in south india you would see um, probably at least three-fourths of the plate is going to be full of rice <laughs> or some type of a grain in many places in North India, you'll find um, significant portions of chapati or roti um, or different forms of Indian breads, you know, flatbreads and things like that. Um, and you'll also often find a lot of lentils um, or beans. And so these are, you know, different pulses and beans and legumes. They all contain a dense amount of carbohydrates. And so because of that, when you mix those two together, it becomes a very high carb plate. Every meal becomes pretty high in carbohydrate. Is that necessarily a bad thing? Not necessarily if you take it in the, in the grand scheme of the entire diet as a whole. So we got to keep making observations. We can't say that it's unhealthy yet or right now because if you just put a magnifying glass on a single macronutrient, then you might miss out on the whole of the diet because there's lots of people who are completely vegan, having mostly beans and lentils for their protein sources because those beans, lentils, legumes, they also contain a pretty high amount of protein. And so you can't say that those carb dense foods are necessarily unhealthy because there's people thriving on those around the world. But the Indian diet does tend to be pretty high in carbs. When it comes to meat or non-vegetarian, so that's any type of meat, so that's red or white meat or egg or fish um, or uh, even dairy products, you know, these, these non-vegetarian type things. Uh, but meat specifically, you, it's really common in India for like no more than one meal a day and oftentimes as low as one meal per week uh, for many families and individuals. Um, only one meal per week or one meal per day has meat in it. Uh, which for an American or someone in the Western world, that's like shocking. You're like, what do you eat? You know, <laughs> because uh, for comparing that to a Western diet or an, even a European diet, they typically have at least two meals per day that have some sort of meat in it. Oftentimes three meals in a day have meat in it and they have meat snacks like jerky and all that. So um, very different in that sense. And so that just makes the entire macronutrient makeup of their diet slightly different than what you'd find in the Western world. Again, it's not necessarily wrong. Let's keep making observations. And so whenever there is less meat in the diet, that means that, uh, or less protein, really protein dense foods in the diet, that means that you might need a little bit more of other macronutrients like carbs and fats to make up for, uh, to get some more flavor and to get full enough because oftentimes, uh, the carb dense foods are not super filling. And so you add fats to add some flavor and make it more palatable. And there's layer upon layer of different spices. Spices are cheap and abundant in India. It's awesome. India has been exporting spices around the world for centuries because everybody wants these spices that India grows and thrives on. And, uh, and <laughs> many, Indian foods have like at minimum five or six different spices and not even that you add in different flavorful leaves and things that you get here the fresh leaves like curry leaves or or, or coriander or cilantro type 
leaves, anything uh, that adds tons of flavor to it. And so that's the way that you kind of get around it because protein rich foods often pack a ton of flavor in them. If you're gonna not have that, you gotta find the flavor somewhere else, which India has totally mastered. Pretty cool. Uh, but because the, the protein dense foods are slightly less and there's more carb dense foods and there's fats, um, there is protein in the beans and lentils that an Indian diet has, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're getting a ton of protein. But does that mean that India is deficient in protein? Not necessarily. Um, our body needs around 0.8 grams per, per kilogram. Um, so let's let's say I weighed, you know, 100 kilograms. I would need around 80 grams of protein per day to sustain my normal body structures and processes um, and hormones. And so, protein is a building block of life. It's literally involved in every single structure and function of our body. And so, it is really important. But we only need about 0.8 grams per kilogram just to maintain our normal body function. But that does not include um, you know, the protein that's required for supporting our, phys our physiological demands of exercise and our daily activities. And so just to sustain who we are, we do need that 0.8. But if we're not getting more than that and we're trying to be super active, we may not be thriving or making the kind of progress that we want to make. Um, but if you look at the typical Indian diet, it oftentimes, if they are getting regular doses of um, things like yogurt or egg or uh, pretty decent amounts of um, you know dal or beans and legumes and pulses then they're not necessarily protein deficient but they may not be able to just maintain significant amounts of lean mass or muscle mass and so what does that result in you find indians being healthy and living long lives but they just don't necessarily have a large muscle mass whereas maybe a westerner is like naturally super built just because of their diet it supports that um, an indian will oftentimes look a little bit leaner in their limbs um, they can be completely fine and healthy and have normal body function but it's going to be harder for them to put on significant amounts of muscle mass if they don't eat more protein and so that just results in a different body structure for many Indians. And it also becomes a little bit more difficult for an Indian to become super lean if they're um, having a higher carb nature type of a diet. But it doesn't mean they're deficient in protein. For example, if you're going to look at, say, 100 grams of dal, that's going to have around 24 grams of protein in it. That's sweet. That's awesome. If you're going to look at the same 100 grams of any type of a meat, you're going to get around 20 to 22 grams of protein. So take that with a grain of salt, though, because 100 grams of dal is huge compared to 100 grams of a, of a meat because meat is much more dense and heavy. And so that, that portion is a lot smaller, takes up less space in your stomach than 100 grams of dal which if you're going to be a guy and you need to try to get two portions of protein in a single meal like I do uh, to support some good lean mass, that means I got to eat 200 grams of dal in a single meal. And that is like half a plate full of dal. That is a lot. That's asking for some serious flatulence and, some, and potentially some serious uh, bloating in the stomach. So that's just, a, you know, take that with a grain of salt. You can get a lot of protein from the pulses, but you do need to prepare them well. Uh, we'll get more into that later. But if you even look at other things that are common in the Indian diet, such as grains, you do get small amounts of grains or small amounts of protein from grains. Like, for example, some raw cooked rice uh, can get 9 to 14 grams of protein per 100 grams or nuts you can get a little bit of you know four to six grams of protein per serving which is only about the size of your thumb so you can kind of mix and match like a like a vegan diet would a plant-based diet would mix and match different foods to get all the essential amino acids that your body needs and amino acids are those building blocks that make up every individual protein and so you often find nowadays that you you see even vegetarian Indians who typically have you know a plant-based diet. They'll also mix in eggs at least once a day, so that is getting them all the essential amino acids and getting a little bit more protein-dense food. And you also have paneer, which is um, a form of like cottage cheese. It's like condensed cheese. Um, it kind of looks 
like tofu, like a block of tofu, uh, but it's essentially cheese. It's a dairy product. And you can get 18 grams per serving or per 100 grams of that, which 100 grams of that, um, you know, it's going to look about the size of your palm ish. And, uh, but the caveat with that, there's a cost. If you to have a full serving of paneer, you're also getting 14 grams of fat, which can be, that's like two servings of fat from the paneer by itself, not counting what you cook it in or what you put it with in a curry or anything like that. So that's something to consider. And so with this, you can see that, I mean, it's definitely possible to not be deficient in protein at all on an Indian diet, but with if you're going to have mostly a plant-based diet or using some of those other uh, vegetarian options like paneer, you're gonna end up having a higher carb and a higher fat diet, which is very common in Indian cooking. And so that kind of leads me into um, the, the fats that a typical Indian diet will use. It's become super common in the developed world um, of India to use highly refined, cheap, hydrogenated oils, things like canola oil, safflower oil, um, even peanut oil, things that are highly refined. So they have a long shelf life. You see them in huge bulk bags that weigh several kgs um, sitting on the shelves of supermarkets. And you even find olive oil. So the difference between olive oil and extra virgin olive oil is that olive oil doesn't have requirements to be pure. So you'll find mixes of other different cheap hydrogenated oils to increase the bulk of that product, increase the shelf life. And so it's in these big plastic containers. And so it's not necessarily more healthy at all. It just has that label because there's olive oil in it. It makes it healthy, right? Not necessarily. And so with these uses of cheap hydrogenated oils, those are pro-inflammatory. Those can cause inflammation in the gut, in the, in the body, in the entire system. And so what that does is if that and other processed foods, which are becoming more and more common in the Indian diet, uh, things like pastas, maggi, um, instant stuff, um, even the high amount of sugar intake and sweets, you know, it doesn't matter what sh the sugar form is, whether it's jaggery or honey or straight up sugar or sugar substitute, it affects your body negatively. It's pro-inflammatory and that can affect your gut. And what happens whenever your gut and the rest of your body gets in a pro-inflammatory state, when it's in an inflamed state, that affects your absorption, which decreases the efficiency of your digestion, which could end up leading to worse digestion of those protein-dense beans and lentils um, and everything that you're having. So you end up getting more bloated. You might not be absorbing as much of the protein that you want to be absorbing. You might be getting symptoms of leaky gut uh, syndrome and uh, or irritable, irritable bowel syndrome where you just have pain. And, with the, and so that can lead to some unfortunate side effects if you're having a lot of um, highly refined oils. And those just aren't super great for health anywhere in the world. And so uh, I mean, using those for frying a lot of food, adding a lot of fat to the diet, um, it just, easily increases the overall calorie intake which can lead to obesity and so uh that all that to say that is one very negative side of food worldwide not just in india the use of cheap hydrogenated oils is just not great for your body and so we'll get into more different recommendations here as we keep moving but an awesome thing that india is doing is using superfoods that the rest of the world is just craving that everybody says you should be eating these things like turmeric oh my goodness you can buy it by the kg in india which is amazing because it's so abundant here it's just, i mean they export it all over the world um there's i mean cinnamon there's fermented foods there's so many different types of f fermented foods that people just commonly make in their home which is awesome for helping add those probiotics, those natural probiotics to your gut to help with, with aiding in digestion and making sure you're absorbing food at your best and keeping your, your digestion healthy. And so it's awesome. Those are just naturally incorporated. And, but those do need to be made in the home. If you're buying them commercially, they're going to have less and less probiotics um, in them because they're just mass produced. Um, but then with those awesome superfoods 
I mean, things like not just the spices, but also things like drumsticks or drumstick leaf, which is a moringa leaf, moringa olifera. And that's a huge superfood. And there's other fruits and vegetables that are amazing superfoods that are just in abundance and produce here is significantly cheaper than it is in the Western world because it's grown here in a temperate climate in India. So pretty awesome things that there's, so there's some pluses and some minuses about the Indian diet. And so with the higher tendency towards processed or even uh, heavily, you know, preserved or the highly processed rice, you know, the cheaper stuff that ends up coming at a cost to your body, coming at a cost to your digestion, which makes it harder to harder on your gut, makes it easier to consume more calories without even noticing it because the more processed it is, the more it can trick your brain into thinking that you're not full yet. And so you end up eating more, which gets you a calorie surplus and you're not where you're at, not where you want to be. Um, there's a other couple of interesting things about the India, just cultural norms and advice from um, people in the past is that you, a lot of times you don't drink any fluid with meals. And so you end up eating more because you're not filling your body with any water. There is some um, theories out there um, that are passed down to families that you know you'll decrease the acidity in your stomach uh, by drinking water with a meal. It really depends on the person. Not necessarily true across the board, especially if you're having some acidic foods. You may not need to worry about that. Um, but that's an interesting one. Is if you're waiting to have water till after your meal, you may not have total amount of water that you need throughout the day. You may be living a little dehydrated, but also you may not be helping with motility, moving that food through your digestion, and you may be eating too much because you're not putting some extra fluid to fill up your stomach to make you feel full. And so, and another interesting thing, it's really common to eat with your hands in India, which is fine, it's totally cool. But one thing I've noticed, even as I eat Indian food, is you tend to just shovel it in. <laughs> and so it's, it's easy to just like be ready with that next handful, you put it in, and so that food is gone super fast. Within a few minutes, the whole plate's gone. Um, I've been blown away at seeing some people having a full plate of rice and multiple other things on their plate and it's gone within a few minutes. I'm like, wow, I can't even fathom eating that fast. Um, and oftentimes the Indian food is cooked so well that it's, it's, uh, it's, you don't have to chew very much to eat it. And so you end up just swallowing. And so there's very little effort that goes into eating. So you end up eating fast, which has a cost in itself where you end up eating more then you need to easily because if you're eating too fast, your hormones in your digestive system don't have the opportunity to tell your brain and your feeling that you are actually full. And so you eat too much and then later you're too full, your blood sugar spikes, and then you feel super nappy and it's hard to get through the rest of the day. So big takeaways here. The Indian diet tends to be relatively high carb and even sometimes high fat also, uh, depending on how you cook in the home. And it tends to be lower in protein and often lower in vegetables as well. People are more focused on the carbs and fats. Um, and the spices used, the variety of spices and the nutrient, like the micronutrient powerhouse that those are, the antioxidants and everything, those are awesome. The spices are amazing. But the oils that are being used these days are highly processed and just not good for health. And so what do we take away from this? You know, how can you have an Indian diet? How can even someone in the Western world who loves Indian food have Indian food on a regular, semi-regular basis and really make the best of it? Or if you are in India or you have an Indian family and your life is Indian food, how can you make the most of it? How can you eat a better diet, a more balanced diet. Well, I got some tips for you. Let's get practical here. So big things, make your legumes, your pulses, your dal, your beans, make those thick. So using less water, of course, you have to go through all the preparations to make sure that you get them easy to cook, prepped. Um, for example, you know, some people are worried about the reactiveness of lectins that are in beans and lentils. If you soak those properly, cook them properly, those get reduced significantly 
So for majority of people, there's no issue in their gut at all. If your um, microbiome, the probiotics in your gut are healthy, then your digestion rocks uh, with those uh, beans and lentils and everything. So, but make your doll thick is the tip. So what does that do? That means that you're gonna end up needing less of roti or rice or other grains or anything to eat with that. Um, you might even consider not having any, if that's gonna be your carb dense food, it's, it's gonna be both your carbs and your protein in one, especially if you struggle to have much of an appetite. And so, uh, and so what would you do with that? You end up eating it with a spoon, you know, consider that. Or if it's thick enough, you can even grab the doll by itself with your hand and mix it with other things on your plate. So that's tip number one, make it thick. Then try to get more protein or protein dense foods. And so that can include having thick dal, those thick beans and lentil curries that you like to make. Uh, but also, you know, consider adding egg if you're willing to have egg. If you um, are willing to try other foods as well. I mean, you can have a common thing in India is curd or this is like homemade yogurt. And so mixing that in with very little to even no rice you can have it in a bowl and eat with a spoon and if you want to flavor it up a little bit you can add whatever spices you want or you can add a little bit of pickle or you can even add a little bit of fruit um, those are ways to get a little bit more protein along with the beans and lentils that you would be having um, but even consider if you are a non-vegetarian family consider having meat more than just once a week or if you can afford it, you know, having at least one meal a day where you have, you know, two full portions of meat uh, for a male or one full portion uh, for a female per day. And so you're getting at least one meal a day where you're having a, a significant amount of protein dense food as a non vegetarian that is going to be a smaller amount of food that will help you feel fuller for longer and get you the protein you need. So a higher protein diet, there's been abundance of research showing that having you know 1.5 and even up to two grams per, per kilogram helps you thrive with your, um, with your lean body tissues and your overall body processes and it helps you stay leaner, fuller for longer. So eating more protein. Next tip is eat more veggies. Okay, I've seen so many Indian homes where like the priority is put on um, the carbohydrate, whatever that is, you know, that's whatever that's rice, potato, um, the pulses, or even um, the roti, things like that. And so eat more veggies. It doesn't matter what the veggie is, eat the rainbow, whatever is in season, whatever you can get your hands on, whatever is a good deal, have as many colors as you can, whatever is on hand. And, with the Indian curry, like the base spices and everything that you use, it gets a similar flavor to everything and you can just layer that in and get creative with whatever. You can cook them, you can have them raw, whatever you want to have, however you like your veggies. Definitely try not to use sauces with raw veggies, um, especially the creamy ones. But if you can get um, veggies, you can cook them um, or have them raw, but having those mixed in on your plate and having that be a significant portion of your plate is going to help you get extra water because there's significant water content in veggies. It's gonna help you feel full. And there's also valuable fibers that feeds the microbiome in your gut that helps improve digestion and gets you awesome micronutrients and they're super low in calories. So helps you feel full, gets you tons of other benefits, awesome, eat more veggies. Get creative with how you can make them the way you like them. Next thing is eat more fermented foods or even take a pro probiotic. And so if you have gotten out of the habit of having fermented foods, whether you're a Westerner or an Indian, um, having fermented foods, things like um, yogurt or even uh, kefir or even things like uh, drinking kombucha or there's so many different forms of different fermented foods around the world. But if you're not getting much of those, I definitely recommend taking a probiotic that has at least 50 million or 50 billion CBU, uh, which that just means that there's a whole bunch of uh, multiple different strains of probiotics in there. there are the bacteria in our gut that we need for digesting food properly is constantly turning over. So if we don't feed that well, it affects our digestion, our absorption, the way we feel, the way we look. And so next thing is use less oil in general. I mean, so many uh, 
Indian foods are just like, there's this layer of oil that's just like swimming in, you know, on a, on a curry. Or it's like you're, when you're eating with your hand, your hand gets covered in oil. And so know this, I've had both versions, the oily kind and the less oily kind, both taste great. Um, and so whatever, you know, we some, at some point we have to get past our cultural sort of nostalgia or this feeling of like oh if there's not some oil sitting on top that means it's not good or it's not flavorful enough not necessarily true you might have to get a little bit used to it but it's going to be better for your overall health if you let, use less oil for a majority of indian recipes uh, for an entire batch that feeds multiple people you don't need any more than two to maximum three tablespoons of oil in your preparation and oftentimes it takes less. You need a little bit of oil to sort of activate some of the spices, bring out some of the flavors. You need a little bit for a marinade and you might need a little bit for a sort of like a final topping or something. If you're adding any nuts, some of those oils come out of those nuts and cooking. Um, so you don't need to add a ton to make it great flavor. And there's so many other spices and things that you're putting in that's going to add to the flavor of the dish. You don't need to use a ton of oil. And the oils you use, I invite you to experiment. There's the top three oils that I would recommend would be like a for an Indian cooking specifically is would be like a grass fed ghee. Okay, not the cheap kind that's maybe even somewhat refined in, in order to make it its shelf life longer. Getting a grass fed ghee that's really fresh, um, an extra virgin olive oil. So that means it needs to be sealed well, it needs to be in a dark bottle, it should be a little bit thick, it has some viscosity, um, and a little bit of bite to it whenever you taste it um, and a cold pressed coconut oil um, and so these are the top three oils i invite you to experiment try your different um, favorite foods and indian dishes with these three oils and see if they taste so drastically different that you hate it or if it's actually still pretty good um, because these three oils are going to be significantly better for your health overall and of course, you can get fats from other things like the you know other foods that you're using in your preparation for your dishes. And so by using less oil, that might mean you're doing less frying in general, which is great not to bread things and fry it. <laughs> you know, having a pakoda, you know, fried foods all the time. We don't need to fry our vegetables to make them taste good. We can put them in a curry. We can add them to a lot of things and it can still taste great. And so... That leads to less frying in general, less oils and fats in cooking, and we still get some tasty flavors out of it. And then the last thing is just a general practice that all of us need to have is just eating slowly and mindfully. If you're eating with hand, you tend to just shovel it in or wolf it down. Um, try your best to remove distractions and be more consciously aware and chew your food, enjoy your food. See if you can stretch your meal time, your time it takes to finish one plate, to 15 to 20 minutes. It's going to do your digestion and your body a lot of good. So these are just a few tips, some observations I made on the Indian diet. It's an amazing, amazing flavor profile. There's amazing foods. There's definitely some highs and some lows in the traditional way of eating. If you guys like this episode, I can also do this for a Western diet and different other types of diets around the world. Give me some feedback on this. Uh, but with those tips, man, there's definitely ways that you can take an Indian diet and make it healthier and fit you better for your goals, for your physique, for the way you want to look and feel. You can still have the flavors and traditions and the love of Indian food and still live a healthy lifestyle and be super fit. And so this is the, man, this is all that I can say for now, taking up plenty of time on this uh, for the Indian diet. But man, I've loved talking about this. I'm passionate about Indian, Indian cuisine. It's super good and tasty. Um, but if you want to do, you want to hear more episodes like this, give me some feedback. Give me a rating on the podcast, whether it's on Spotify or on Apple Podcasts. You can rate them both. Leave a comment. Shoot me a message. Leave a comment if you're watching this on YouTube. I want to hear your thoughts, your questions. I'll try to answer them the best I can. And, and I want to hear your suggestions for future episodes because we want to be talking about the topics and the things that matter to you most as our viewers and listeners. And I want to keep adding value to you. So thanks for listening today, guys. We'll catch you on the next one.